Hi, this is Susan Proper. Welcome to Women Inspired to Wellness. Today is November 5th, 2020. And I have a guest today coming to us from San Diego, California. She is a, uh, a very inspiring woman who coaches regarding um, emotional uh, and financial, sexual, and all kinds of abusive uh, situations because she herself has been there and knows about it. And uh, that is the kind of person that you want coaching uh, you when it comes to having experience and knowledge in that kind of a situation. So we have with us today a beautiful guest, uh, Rosie Aiello. So welcome, Rosie. Thank you so much for being here with me today. Thank you, Susan. It's, it's great to be here, really. <laughs> it's, it's, we, and, had a, we had a lot of fun beforehand. <laughs> yes, we did. In the green room um, <clears throat> while we were setting up. Yes, we did. So um, why don't you tell us a little bit about your story and what led you to become a, a coach and uh, I know this can be a difficult topic uh, for some women to even admit that they're experiencing. So uh, why don't you just share a little bit about your story? Okay, sure. I'd love to. Um, I, I, I'm from California, as you, you mentioned, and I was in corporate finance, <clears throat> rising, the, cal rising the, the ladder to be a uh, senior in, in that um, company. And then I married a man who is from the Middle East. I married a Christian man. We uh, and we moved immediately to the Middle East because he was already working there. And um, we were in Saudi Arabia first, and then Beirut, Lebanon afterwards. And from the get go, I there was something off. You know, I was always being put down. I was. Be, I mean, I remember even on our um, honeymoon, I just felt horrible. Well, I really didn't like your dress, your wedding dress, mm -hmm. and I just have to tell you that. So there were all these, these things that uh, were, were constantly building up. And uh, I, I remember times when he would just sit me down and yell at me for literally anywhere from an hour, if I was lucky, to three to four hours nonstop, repeating himself and repeating himself. And I was constantly being put down. And no matter what I did, it was never right. It was never good enough. And this constant battle. And then, you know, it's like, Sometimes I liken it to like a volcano that explodes, you know, the lava is just spewing out and then mm -hmm. it pours down and starts to cool down. Well, lava's cooled down. He's kind of cooled down. Well, I haven't cooled down. And he says, oh yeah, well, you know, let's, let's you know, go make love. I'm like, you know, I didn't want to be touched. So there's all, all of these were running in the background and I didn't know, Susan, this, this is the thing I really want uh, our listener to hear is that. I was married 18 years before I even knew I was in an abusive relationship. Oh my gosh. Because I, I didn't have the vocabulary. I just thought it was all me. He made sure to let me know that it was all my problem. If I only did better, if I only did better than, you know, you, you do better then this relationship will be better. And he literally told me those words. And so I would just apologize over and over and over and over and still get verbally, emotionally beat up and just felt horrible. Mm -hmm. And I couldn't, I couldn't understand how could I have been so, so well adjusted and doing so well when I was working in, in corporate finance and, and had so many responsibilities and helping billion dollar companies merge and everything else. And yet in my relationship, I was just totally incompetent, according right. to him. Mm -hmm. So we would come back to the United States to visit my family. And during that time, I found a book and that book made me realize, oh, I'm, I'm, I'm not crazy. Uh, it's not me. Uh, it was very hard. But even though I knew that it would take another number of years before I could get out, because my daughter in the Middle East, custody automatically goes to the father oh, wow. between the ages of seven, when they're a child, the mother can keep it, but between seven and 18, um, until they get major, you leave, you don't have, there's, there's no court case, right? My husband was not American citizen. He still, he, he had a green card at the time, and then he relinquished it, but he had a Lebanese citizenship. So over there, it's like, there's no battle. So there's, there was no way in heaven I would ever 
do anything to jeopardize losing my daughter. So I made conscious decisions to stay Mm -hmm. as tough as it was and getting mentally beat up constantly. And then as she became a teenager, adolescence, you know how teenagers are. They're pushing the envelope. They're, you know, rebelling. Of course, he didn't like any of that. He liked his little girl to be a little girl. And um, then as she got older, um, and she was now at the university, but in Lebanon, Beirut, Lebanon, American University of Beirut in Lebanon, she came to me one day and she said, mom, you got to get me away from my abusive father. So in four months, I planned the escape of our lives because you, I, it was the only way out. There was no talking to him. I, I tried everything to make the marriage work. Even months, even during that period of the escape, I was still trying to make the marriage work. I mean, isn't that crazy? The crazy That's totally thinking? crazy. Right? So, yeah. Stop, stop. Just stop for a minute. I have so many questions. <laughs> so, <laughs> Um, okay. So how long did you know this man before you married him? Well, this is interesting. I met him at the university. He was in graduate schools. I was an undergrad and we had kind of dated casually then, but then we kind of went our separate ways and we reunited like 13 years later. So I, I knew him, but I wasn't with him that that whole time. Mm -hmm. And he came back into my life before he was visiting and came back and kind of things reignited. And, you know, if I looked at him, he's smart, super smart, super charming, um, great jokes. Are, we had a lot of values in common. I mean, he was Christian. I was a Christian. We liked family, lots and lots of things. Um, and there were no, no indications, no, nothing before you got married, no, no indications at all that this guy was um, controlling or manipulative or anything like that? Well, those are good questions. And the answer is yes and no. The answer is yes, there were, but I was totally unaware of them oh. because I wasn't looking for them. I was uh, and this is what women have a tendency to do. And this is one thing I really preach is that we make excuses for the relationship because there's so much good. We make excuses for what isn't. So yeah, there were plenty, but I didn't know what they were. Right. I was totally, it wasn't like I was blindly in love. I was just unaware of these signs. So I'm, you know, when you are, especially a women, a, you know, a type women, yeah. we want, we can make it work. We're out there. We can fix things. So yeah. I had the fix it mentality and he made sure I had the fix it mentality. Uh, he would make me feel bad. Oh, I, you know, he asked me to do something and I didn't do it right away. Then he would get upset. It's like, oh my gosh, I'm a terrible person. Right. Mm-hmm. So it always came. I always made it come back to me and he mm-hmm. always made it come back to me. And I thought, well, I'm just going to work harder. This is a good right, right. man. Now, um, sorry, I'm interrupting you again. But no, when you went back home to visit your family, um, did your family notice? I mean, this must have affected your personality and your daughter's personality and your whole behavior. Did your oh, family absolutely. say anything? Notice anything? And, you know, it's 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 it, well, it did and it didn't because when you're married to these kinds of people, you become a great actress. Mm-hmm. I mean, I think everyone who's been in these kind of relationships becomes, we should all receive the best actress award. Mm-hmm. We should, nobody knew. Okay. Nobody knew. And literally nobody knew until I read the book. It was called the verbally abusive relationship by Patricia Evans. Until I read that book, um, I just thought it was all me. And had no clue that it was, it was really him. So I am, and nobody knew. I mean, I wasn't until I read that book. Then I told my brother and two best friends in the United States. So three people in 18 years and really 25 years knew of my life. Wow. And only the last six of it until I escaped or whatever it was. My God. Can you say the name of that book again? It's called The Verbally Abusive Relationship by Patricia Evans. Okay. Mm -hmm. Oh, my gosh. So tell me about your escape. Um, When my daughter came to me. When my daughter came to me that that day, I mean, I'll never forget about it. I'll never forget it. 
she was just in hysterics because she was she was living with us even though she was in the university that's a long story behind that it's not uncommon in the middle east for adult children to live with their parents until they get married but there's more to it um and, and so because i had told her when she was 16 after i read the book i said oh you know what your father is doing is it's called abuse and and you know it's not right but see i would never ever um say anything to him in front of him you know like if he was um, demeaning her, I would just be quiet. So she was raised with a mother who never stood up for herself. This is okay. an important point. So anyway, we're getting back to the escape. So I would, um, I, <laughs> I'm organized, you know, because I used to do financial planning. So I, I knew how to put things together, even though my brain was pretty much uh, fried. I started to slowly pack up things. And then I, I enlisted two more friends, but in Lebanon to help me. They were both Americans married to different nationalities. And um, because I needed their help. So I slowly started to remove things from the house. And I the first things I took were the photo albums. And they were in our family room behind books. So I took those. I took things off the wall, but I replaced them with other, other things. I We had, we didn't, we had an, a medium sized house, not really big, but I went into the guest bath bedroom where it had a bathroom. I locked the door and I slowly packed things and taped things up. And so I'm in a condominium building has six, six of, uh, uh, homes. So I had to make sure nobody saw me. Nobody saw me um, get the boxes. Nobody saw me put those boxes and put them in the truck of my car. I had to live in a uh, housekeeper. I had to make sure that she didn't see anything. Sometimes I'm even like, how in the hell did I even do this, right? Um, I started to photocopy and scan important documents when my husband went out of the house, which was not very often. You know, Every now and then I had a reprieve that he was actually out of town. So I'm doing all of this. And my daughter says, oh, we need to take this, which is on our, um, like a shelf. Can't think of the name in English, but I think of it in the French, uh, in, uh, in our living room. And I said, no, that's right in front. He'll notice that. He really wouldn't have noticed anything. But so slowly over four months, I just took a box here and a box there um, and brought it down to one of these friends' house. And mind you, we don't always have electricity in Lebanon. Mm. So I had to make sure that I had electricity to use the elevator. So a lot of things had to be working and driving. And then the, the, the day came when um, we would have the shipment and I was out of the house for almost the entire day. And he's calling me like 10 times, where are you? Where are you? And I'm sweating beads because it's like, I have to keep making one lie after the other. Then the day comes where we're ready to leave. So the taxi comes, I get into the taxi my daughters are in the taxi and my husband is in front. Oh, all three of us are going to the United States. Oh, and let me tell you, only one is coming back because we would go to the United States every summer to visit my family, okay. my friends and his family, mm -hmm. not his family, but his friends there. So there are no direct flights from Beirut to the United States. So we go to Paris and we stay a couple of days in Paris and then we take a flight from Paris to San Francisco, it's 11 hours. Hmm. And our book, the memoir my daughter and I are writing are called 11 Hours to Freedom. Even on that plane, I was not feeling free. I was just so scared. You know, if I breathed wrong, he would yell at me. I was so afraid of what was going to happen. You know, and on a scale of one to 10 on how, how much I was, the stress and tension was probably 110. And during that whole time I'm planning for the escape, I just told myself, I go, I don't have to be a martyr. My daughter and I deserve a happy and joyful life. Mm -hmm. There was no way I was going to survive it. We were both very suicidal by, by then. And um, so we're on the flight flying and my daughter and I are sitting next to each other. We're looking at each other and I'm looking at him. And it's like, he has no clue what's coming right. down. No clue. I uh, had enlisted my brother to help me. We arrive at San Francisco International Airport. There are some things that happened there, which I'll just, you know, <laughs> I'll, tell you, I'll just leave that aside, but it was pretty interesting. 
I knew exactly where my brother was going to be waiting when the gates opened up, you know, mm-hmm. those doors open up. I didn't have to look around. I knew exactly. My daughter and I brought our, our um, trolleys there, our luggage carts there, parked them behind my brother. Um, I, I was so terrified of my husband. I had my brother talk to him and say, my, my sister's um, is upset with you a little bit, needs some time away. I couldn't even have him say, she's leaving you forever. I just right. couldn't. I, I, I couldn't, it took a lot of work with psychologists for me to be able to spit that out. And so we, some other things happened. Uh, and then my daughter, my brother and I turned our box, our backs and walked out, leaving him alone, standing in the busy airport. Wow. 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 And that was your new beginning. And that was my new beginning. Exactly. I only had a plan A. The the escape was going to work. There was no plan B if it didn't work. Let me tell you that. (laughs) Mm -hmm. It was going to work. Yeah. Mm -hmm. My God, that's amazing. And then you had to square away your own head and your own life. Yeah. I mean, I arrive, we both arrive with the severe PTSD. My daughter has complex PTSD, which is pretty typical when you're a child Mm -hmm. uh, in this kind of an environment, but I had PTSD, I had anxiety, I had depression. Uh, Then, you know, getting, uh, then starting the divorce procedures and I'm now dealing with an international case, right? So it was like 10 times more uh, complicated, 10 times more expensive, just uh, extremely, extremely stressful. Mm -hmm. And then it was like, okay, oh, I'm here now. What what am I going to do with my life? And when I arrived, it was in 2009. It was in the, it was in the deep recession period. And I was 56, 55, 56. So it's like, everyone says, oh my God, you speak all these languages. You have all these experiences. You know, you can just get a job. I was like, yeah, what? I'm just going to walk up to like Chevron or, or somebody and just say, yeah, hire me. Mm -hmm. Like It was just like, and I just, I, I even talked to my, some of my old bosses. It's like in Silicon Valley, it's like, I knew I wouldn't be able to leave my daughter nor handle the, 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 the demands. My brain was pretty fried. Right. Yeah. So, you know, I just took this class, that class that I, um, you know, was, you know, got therapy, was definitely got therapy. Sure. And um, then I was, really came down to it was too hard to find a job so I might as well start a business Mm -hmm. I mean I couldn't write my resume for uh for my thing because I'd been out of the country for 25 years by then right I learned uh, I was there I was 18 years but I had been in this relationship for 25 years Mm -hmm. so it was you know I just it was crazy right but those 25 years gave you something I, I know they gave you a lot of heartache and a journey that People don't ever want to have to experience by choice, but those 25 years gave you something that now you can help others with, right? Yes. You know, I've chosen to, to do that. It, it, it wasn't, um, wasn't in the beginning. I had a different business in the beginning, uh, just time management, productivity, organizing. I had done, I had done a few escapes. That wasn't the first one, actually. I think I was, I was planning, you know, I, God was getting me prepared because each one was harder because I had, we escaped during military conflict. So I've seen a lot of um, military conflict living in the Middle East. Yeah. <laughs> firsthand. So yeah, I, uh, it was really starting to write the memoir that everything started to change. And this was, and I resisted because like, oh my God, who am I? You know, the question was, who am I? How can I help? Because the people kept telling me, well, your, your story, it should be should be a book. It should be a movie. It's like, really? You know, it's just my life. You know? mm-hmm. So, um, and your story can help others. That's like, right. Okay. That's right. So talk about your coaching. How do you coach and help other women with, with what you've been through and, and um, with possibly what they may be going through? Yes. It's um, when you have been in these kinds of relationships, I, I, I you know, so many of us, you know, we have limiting beliefs, things that hold us back. And I, yes. and I, and I say that women who have been in narcissistic, abusive, toxic relationships, whether it's a parental or uh, intimate relation with a partner, 
it's like having these limiting beliefs on steroids. There's, you know, first of all, you have your own and then they pound more into you. Mm-hmm. You know, like I, I heard for decades, you're a terrible mother. You love your daughter, but you're not a good mother, mm-hmm. you know? So that was a, that became a deep belief. I had to have a lot of work to do that. Uh, you don't have a, don't smile because you don't have a pretty smile. You can't do this. You can't do this. So women, they, they lose their voice. Like I literally, he told me not to talk. He would tell me not to ask questions. He would tell me, you know, so I became almost literally mute. So what I, how I help the women is like, help them regain that confidence to get their voice back, to start to learn to believe in themselves. I call the freedom, the freedom journey to be 100% you Mm -hmm. Uh, learning how what's important to you. Like, Oh, there's something important. You know, I, I get to choose what's important for me, not mm-hmm. just live somebody else's life. You know, I, I teach them how to ask confidently for what they want. It's like, oh, really? I can, I can do that. You know, how to receive with grace. Women are such good receivers. I mean, givers, but poor receivers. Yes. Uh, so, so who is your typical client? What does your typical client look like? What, what do they come to you with? They come, they, well, they come if they have been in these kind of situations, a lot of them are coming that now they're ready to move on and they want a relationship. So if they've had difficulties getting into, you know, being afraid, so they have trust issues, but they want to get into a relationship. They don't want to have, you know, they don't want to be alone, but they're, they're how they look at all the limiting beliefs are just strangling them, Mm -hmm. strangling them to get what they want and to have that, that love of their life. Like I have, I am now with the love of my life, a love that I never even could have imagined when That's I first wonderful. arrived. It was like all men were bad. <laughs> I put them all in the same b- bucket. And now I'm just with somebody who just, I mean, I live in love, peace, and joy every day. Mm-hmm. 10 years ago, I could have, I could have not imagined that. Right. And so I help women also realize that these are possible. What mm-hmm. your past doesn't dictate your future and they can maybe understand it uh, conceptually, but I really get down deep so that they can believe in themselves. So you work with women that have, um, not just, uh, been abused, um, let's just say emotionally. Do you work with women that have been abused, uh, sexually or, um, in any other way? Uh, I'm just trying to identify like a a, a client that may come to you. Right. Most of the women um, have had some bit of sexual abuse. If it's, they're all usually kind of combined. Yeah. You know, when you have this, they, they've been physically assaulted. Yeah. It's just, it's not just it, like, even for me, mine was mostly verbal, but yeah. you know, I had it like I had a sprinkling of physical and a sprinkling of sexual and everything else. So um, I teach them that they're not broken. Mm-hmm. They may feel broken. So mm-hmm. the women I work with have been in these toxic relationships. They want to move forward. Right. I'm somebody who helps them move forward in their life. I'm not somebody who helps them deal with the past. We, we address the past, but I don't deal with the past. Right. They know they want to move forward and they feel stuck. Okay. Why can't, and what's you, un- what's also important to understand is that how you show up in one place is how you show up everywhere. So it will affect their work, whether they're, they have their, have their own business or whether they are uh, working for somebody else. If you don't have confidence in yourself, it's going to show up everywhere. Sure. That's why women don't ask for raises. They don't speak up in meetings. It's all because of their own self-value. Yeah. And Absolutely. That I, that's yeah, how I help, totally I help them reclaim now, that. Um, I know you have a, some kind of a, and I, forgive me for not having this information immediately at hand, but you have a coaching um, <clears throat> package. And I, I just want to talk about your social media too, in case people that are listening right now can can uh, reach out to you. You have a Facebook uh, page that's called The Rosie Aiello. Yeah, I have The Rosie Aiello one. And then I have the, I have a page called The Love is Kind Movement. Okay. And then I have the women's, the Love is Kind Women's Circle. That's a private group or a closed group. So, you know, Facebook kind of changed the, the dynamics here, but it's yeah. closed. So, so women feel safe in it. Okay. You know, so they can get encouragement there. 
And women can um, reach out to me because the first thing is creating that awareness. Remember, as you were telling me before, well, did he have any signs? Like, I don't know. I didn't know anything, mm. right? Is really, but I have, it's called the Freedom Fulfillment Quiz. Just, you just go to freedomfulfillmentquiz.com. And it's a short quiz, takes like four minutes where they are self-identifying where they are, how they think. And it's not about the other person. It's all about them. Mm -hmm. Because until you know where you're at, and then you say, oh, well, I don't want to be there, right? right? I don't want a four. I want a 10 on how confidently I can ask for, for yeah. my, what I want, how I could show up. Right. I, I want to be able to trust myself. A lot of these women don't trust their own decisions. Yeah. So again, if you're working for somebody, it's like, you may, you may start to doubt yourself. This is how it manifests in so many different ways. Right. So those are two ways. And they can always go to my website, theloveiskindnetwork.com. Okay. And you are also on LinkedIn. I know um, mm -hmm. a lot of people, um, especially type A women, yeah. you know, they're in that corporate world. They are very successful, uh, yet they may have this type of a, a situation going on in their married life or in their significant other kind of a life. And nobody would guess or know that. And they are, they don't want to admit it. So you are on yeah. LinkedIn also as uh, Rosie Aiello, just your name. Right. Okay. And this is so, this is a really good point because a lot of women think if I'm so smart, how did I get myself into this? Yeah. So there's lots of self-blame. There's lots of shame. They didn't want to talk about it. Like I told you, and nobody knew I was so full of shame uh, and just thinking, well, I can figure this out. I can do this by myself and even getting out so you keep hiding it and hiding it and it serves no purpose but creating making your world smaller yes yeah i i i totally understand that um and um you know i thank god i got a knock on wood here i have not been in that kind of a relationship but i have known people who have been in that kind of a relationship and you are absolutely right the 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 way the um the self-perception is just, it's amazing how it, the person that you once knew becomes a totally different person. And yeah. that's why I, I was wondering if your family recognized that. But then again, um, you are right. You become, uh, you become uh, an actress. You become able to mm -hmm. um, disguise what is really happening and uh, hide hide that. And, uh, and this is true. And I, and that, that's a good segue into really the, the topic of your podcast about the wellness, mm -hmm. because as, as most women that, that I have talked to, not every, but I'll say 99%, I've talked to women all over the world. What happens because you're constantly hiding yourself because you're trying not yet revealing your fully, your, your real, true, fully expressed self. It's like living in a pressure cooker. Yes. Right? And you can't, you can't speak, you can't be yourself. So something is like popping out. Mm -hmm. And women, personally, I've had um, fibromyalgia, which is chronic pain, which is very, very common. And, and that wasn't diagnosed for years. O over 10 years, it wasn't diagnosed until, you know, it was getting worse and worse, where I was walking literally like a 90, 95 year old woman, I could barely move. I could barely go upstairs. You just, it's just incredible how I was literally shrinking. I was curved over. Mm. I mean, how it had it manifest. It's just incredible. I also had a full hysterectomy. You see how, how everything links, you know, the body is just shutting down. Yeah. It's like, this is not working. I've talked to women who've had thyroid problems, breast cancer, all kinds of physical health issues because of the abuse, because the, 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 the woman can't express herself yes. and she's, she's burning up and her cells are dying inside. Yes. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. And so that's um, another, that's how I help women. <laughs> yeah. It, you know, becomes it, it, at that point, you're, you're not taking care of yourself and self-care is so important because if you are not taking care of yourself, you cannot, how can you take care of, I'm not talking about you necessarily, mm -hmm. but how can you take care of others? How can you take care of your daughter? How can you take care of your, a parent, or how can you take care of anybody else? If you yourself are not well, if you are letting yourself wither away, 
uh, because you're not maintaining self-care, if you're not getting enough sleep, if you're not eating right, if you're not exercising right, if you're not doing all the things that you need to do to maintain your own health. And it, again, it may not be because you don't um, want to or care, but it may be because of a situation like what you're talking about where you are just being, um, I don't even know the right word to say, but you're being uh, so pounded every day with all this negativity, 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 that you're crushed. Your, your spirit is crushed and you are being crushed and you're helpless and don't know what to do. Yeah, it's, it's so true, Susan, how you um, summarize that because that is the case. And you just, you just, what happens is there's a lot of things also going on in the brain mm -hmm. and your brain almost kind of gets rewired. So because you believe it and you, you're helpless, you, you can't, your prefrontal cortex just stops functioning. You know, it's your, your amygdala, which is the, the fight or flight is constantly firing off, which yeah. the, the body is not meant to have that fire off all the time. It's just supposed to be for an instant. You get, you run away from the tiger or the bear or whatever. And then, and then, you know, you calm down yeah. But when you're always on, on assault. Okay. You're always on assault. It's in hyper alert. And so there's no room or time for the chemicals to form and to start using your prefrontal cortexes, which is modern person has, has, ha, has you. You, you can't make decisions. You can't think. That's why women will say, well, I'm in a fog. It's because you are literally in a fog. And so all of these, your chemical, you get a chemical imbalance. So you can't function. You can't think. And you know, when you're completely depleted, you're more susceptible to illness. You're more, you're more vulnerable. You're more afraid. You, you don't know how to take care of any. So it just makes the, the situation so much worse. Yes. And then you blame yourself on top of it. That's right. Yeah. Because right. You because didn't. that's what you've been taught to do. Right. Blame right. Yourself. All right. So in there in self-care, are you freaking kidding me? How can I do self-care? That's selfish. Right. Yeah. So we get that attitude. Yeah. Because society puts that onto us. Yes. Right. Exactly. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Oh my God. What an interesting conversation. Okay. Um, you mentioned the, the, um, the test. Can you, can you say oh, that quiz. again? The yeah. quiz. Yes. Yeah, it's called the Freedom Fulfillment Quiz. dot com. Okay. No WW in front of it. Just Freedom Fulfillment Quiz. dot com. And in four short minutes, it's like it's, it's organized in sections. You know, it talks about your vision, talks about you know your your self care, talks about your relationship with others, um, talks about how you can um, set boundaries. You know, boundaries is a, is a big issue women don't have, and I t have a unique way of how I express that and teach it. How it asks. So it just you know shows them what they're thinking and where they're at. And I can mm -hmm. just tell by the scores where their head is at and they can see where they're at. It's like, oh my gosh. Right. And if you want to live a life, you know, you want to just live your life instead of living somebody else's life. It doesn't mean that it's, it's going to be a piece of cake, but to me, it's like, I'd rather fight to create my life and live it and struggle for my own life than to be in pain and suffer and struggle living somebody else's life or, or trying to live a life that somebody else wants me to. That's right. right? I totally agree. So uh, I don't want to give any misconceptions that we're all just dancing. It, you know, it's hard, you know, it's work, but it's worth it. Absolutely. It's worth it. I mean, I just, I, I just, I am so happy. <laughs> you know? I can tell. <laughs> yeah. I am just, you see my, my, I have a joy sign behind me and I'm mm -hmm. just like, that's the goal. You know, my dream was to live a joyful life, but I create that. And that's what I teach my clients is how to create a productive, joyful life. That's wonderful. Yeah. That's wonderful. And all of that information is on your website and your Facebook page. And, yes. and, um, and people can reach out to you um, also on LinkedIn as well. Yes. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Right. Because you just, you know, the whole thing is love is kind because it's love is kind, not terrorizing. Cause I lived in political terrorism and I lived in family terrorism. My God. Yeah. And, um, so you deserve to be treated with kindness and it starts by being kind to yourself. I totally agree. Well, Rosie, thank you so much for a wonderful, wonderful and inspiring conversation. And, um, I really enjoyed talking with you again.
uh, <laughs> and spending a few minutes uh, in the green room with you before our conversation uh, went yeah. live today. <laughs> uh, and please, everybody, uh, take advantage of that quiz that uh, Rosie is offering. I'm sure uh, you'll you'll find that very interesting and eye opening as well. And um, I will put uh, all of Rosie's contact information in the mm -hmm. podcast notes. And uh, you can uh, reach out to Rosie. Um, and also, uh, I will put that book um, uh, that Rosie oh, read. Patricia Evan. Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. I'll put that book information yeah. there as well, because I'm sure uh, that will be interesting to some listeners, too. So. Yeah. yeah, it will be. And I'm a personal friend of hers, too. And, and I wanted to share, too, that I have a free guidebook, too, on the 11 Freedom Fulfillment Pillars. So these are exactly what I follow to create the life I have so that they can go to my website and get that free guidebook, too. OK, that will fantastic. Help them. Yeah, thank you. All right. Well, thank you so much, Rosie. This was really a pleasure. Thank you again. Yes. Thank you. <laughs>